Good day, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Let's try it again. Good day, everyone. Good day. All right, thank you. Come on now. Um, well, thank you and, and a great, great welcome to all of you for being here this afternoon um, for this discussion on the faces of women in prison, a push for second chances. A special thanks to our partners, the Education Trust. Woo. I have a list of names, so if I miss you, please don't cause chalk it to my heart, okay? John King, Kelly McManus, Takira Winfield Dixon, Jack Fleming, Keith Curry, and the entire team. You have been incredible, 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 and we thank you so much for this partnership. A huge thank you to the Lumina Foundation. for understanding the importance of the voices of those directly impacted to not only share our experiences, but to also be compensated and valued for our expertise and our time. Thank you. And thank you, Allison Williams, for being here and for, for, for lending your presence, your influence, and also your voice to this issue around reinstatement of Pell Grants, higher education. Thank you so much. And so, and so, let's get to the business. So I'm Topeka K. Sam, the founder and executive director of the Ladies of Hope Ministries. Our mission is to provide disenfranchised and marginalized women and girls with resources and opportunity through access to higher quality education, spiritual empowerment, entrepreneurship and career development, advocacy, and housing. Today, we launch our newest program publicly, The Faces of Women in Prison. We are humbled and honored again to launch it here first with our partners and trust and have this push for second chances. I would also like to introduce and just say thank you to our program director, L'Oreal Lamond. <laughs> we are only as strong as our team, so I'd like to make sure that I recognize everyone for that. And so The Faces was a vision that I had while I was incarcerated to make sure that the voices of women um, were brought out. Because I felt like when I was incarcerated that if people actually saw what women went through, that there would be some systemic change. And so what this does is it encompasses all the women in their lives and being defined and controlled by the criminal legal system. Imprisoned women include currently incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women, the wives and girlfriends of incarcerated men, children, adult women, whose mothers or fathers, and sometimes both parents, are or were even incarcerated. Women imprisoned are the glue that stick families and communities together. Millions of women who are criminalized and marginalized because of their gender, race, ethnicity, income, and gender identity. And so the faces of women in prisons are the girls and women who until very recently have been unseen and their voices unheard. We will create opportunities for our sisters to be visible and heard by providing access to training, political education, and coaching. Each woman's story and experience will be told with the larger context of social, political, and economic force that encourages opportunities and growth for some women and a different road of struggle and survival, most, in, most especially for poor women of color. Each story will be more than a set of bad choices and each woman will speak about policies, law, procedures, and legislation that had they been available to her would have significantly altered her life's direction. The faces of women in prison will seek speaking opportunities such as this in colleges, law schools, policy and public policy forums, conferences and meetings of entrepreneurs and attorneys. And we will seek media opportunities and create our own social media platform so our stories and ideas can have the widest possible impact. We will also provide financial support for speakers and open new opportunities for work, continued education, and growth through travel and connections. And so the Faces of Women in Prisons will inspire our sisters who will see and hear us, and they too will be able to envision themselves as beautiful and brilliant actors to their own lives and are asked to join us. And so when I say beautiful actors, I also want to thank our makeup artist, Christopher Michael, <laughs> who made sure that we were all point for you all, right? <laughs> so uh, for the introduction, and just to give us a little history about education in prison, I want to introduce Susan Rosenberg. 
Susan is a human rights and prisoner rights advocate, adjunct lecturer, communications consultant, award-winning writer, public speaker, and formerly incarcerated person. Her memoir, An American Radical, details her 16 years in federal prison, as well as her conclusions about her prison experience and her past. She was released from prison in 2001 through executive clemency by then President, President Bill Clinton. Upon her release, she worked at American Jewish World Services for 12 years, beginning as a writer, then becoming the director of communications. Post AJWS, Susan has worked extensively in nonprofit communications field with a focus on human rights and international development. She is an adjunct lecturer at Hunter College in the Women and Gender Studies. She is a member of the Prison Writing Committee at Penn America. She's on the board of directors of IDEX, an international development organization, and the Ladies of Hope Ministry. Susan Rosenberg. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. And um, thank you to the Education Trust. And thank you, LOHM organization, near and dear to my heart. Um, so uh, Topeka asked me to come and talk about higher education in prison and a little bit uh, framing it about my own experience in prison. And so I, I will do that. Uh, I, I do want to just say that mass incarceration, I think, is one of the most critical issues of our time and one that we need to address in multiple ways, and I think education is a really important first place of entry into this much larger set of issues that our country has to take on and confront. Um, so let me, uh, let me just start by saying that uh, I'm going to quote Tom Wigger uh, of the New York Times, who, uh, when he was dealing with what happened at the Attica prison, in 1971, came out of the prison and said, I don't know why people think that if you put a person in a cage and you leave them there for years, they'll come out better people. It can't work, it won't work, and we shouldn't do it. That's a good Tom Wicker quote, if you know his writing and his, his work. So having said that, uh, just to say a little bit about my own history with this issue in prison. I was in federal prison from 1984 to 2001. And uh, in 1994, 10 years after I was first uh, sentenced, I was in what was then the first maximum security women's prison in Mariana, Florida. And I worked there, I had a 17 cents an hour job working there. Um, working in a room that was, I don't know, the size of that table, maybe a little bit bigger, um, that doubled as a library and a classroom. And one day I went to work, I reported to work, and there was a sign on the door, and it read, permanently closed. And later that day, a number of correctional officers came with carts and they removed every book in the library, every magazine, every um, textbook and law book. And uh, where they took them, I have no idea. Uh, but they took them all. And I, I asked, well, why are you doing this? What's going on? I probably was a little angrier than that. Um, and their answer was, you don't need these books anymore and they turned around and walked out. That was the day that the uh, crime, Omnibus Crime Act under the Clinton administration was enacted, literally, that day. And that was the day that Pell Grants ended for prisoners. That was the day that they closed classrooms and libraries in every federal prison around the country. Uh, and stopped all higher education on, under the guise that the Pell Grant was now ended. It was also the day that the rights of prisoners were severely curtailed with the end of or the reframing of the right of due process and the end of habeas corpus for prisoners. So the ability to even fight about losing these things was also part of that crime bill. So uh, I would say 
it was one of the most devastating days of my entire prison sentence that day, that education ended, law libraries ended, and the small connection between the inside and the out was frozen. It was not the beginning of the punishment paradigm that we have in this country, but it was a very profound negative milestone in it. A year later, I was transferred to another prison, and uh, it was a general population prison, Danbury, and uh, Connecticut, where there were 1,400 women in that prison. And there, there was still an education building, a small library, a law library, and G GED, the GED program, and English as a second language was mandatorily taught there for women in prison if you didn't speak English or if you didn't have a high school diploma. Um, but college, any higher education, any further way of engaging your mind inside of that prison was gone. Um, what had been a vibrant college program then, run since it had become a women's prison from Marist College in New York, which was a consortium of colleges, uh, was, was eliminated. And the only thing that was left from the Marist program was one single book club with a waiting list to get into that book club for two years. So it went from one thing to complete. Um, I ended up working in that department uh, again for 17 cents um, for five years while I was in that Danbury prison. Um, and a group of prisoners who worked as teachers' aides asked for us to be able to develop curriculum so that we could teach women in prison there, right? Even though we weren't teachers, we all had degrees, and I did at that time have a college degree, as did a number of other women who were in that prison. And because there was nothing for anybody to do except pick up butts and work for Unicor, uh, the, the prison authorities said, okay, we'll let you do that. And for a very unique moment of time, we ended up teaching classes at night that were not for credit, that had nothing to do with getting a degree. But we taught HIV education, health education. We taught grammar, basic grammar. We taught English. Uh, we taught writing, American history, black history, world history, math. Um, and every night, every one of those classes for those years that it was allowed to happen was filled, filled with people who were desperate to learn more under the conditions that we found ourselves, right? So for all the different reasons. Um, they were transformative to us who taught them, and they were transformative to the people who took them. And in 2002, because it was arbitrarily approved to begin with, it was then arbitrarily ended and never replaced. So the last piece, and then I'll get to sort of some conclusions, um, when I was at Danbury working there and teaching as this teacher's aide and doing health education and a number of things uh, there, I enrolled in a long distance learning program to get a master's. And it seemed like it would have been almost impossible, but I, I was really committed to getting a master's to try and take my own education level up. Um, and of course, being in prison, there were no programs that would waive the residency requirement to get a master's, to be enrolled in a master's graduate program. The only one that would was Antioch uh, University. And so I actually did go to, I didn't go, but I <laughs> went <laughs> to the Antioch McGregor Graduate School. And, um, and I ended up creating a long distance learning program there that took me three years to do it. Um, to just take note, the education department of the prison at Danbury was adamantly opposed to this, of course. They were 
unhelpful and skeptical. And basically, they considered, and I think this is kind of a very important point about the culture that we have to challenge in bringing higher education back into prisons, is that they considered college elitist. They considered it a luxury. They considered it a privilege. And since there was nobody even in undergraduate school there, going to graduate school was just completely off the charts of what would be uh, acceptable. They fought me every <coughs> single step of the way. And the only reason that I actually succeeded was because I had outside support, because I had access to resources, because I was white and had been middle class, and because I had had some level of education to begin with. And those resources and privilege allowed me to navigate even under those conditions. I am, I am tragically sorry to say that, uh, to my knowledge, I am the first woman in federal prison to get a master's in this context, and I believe the last. Mm. So, the headline, something so wrong with this picture on every level. So I just want to close by saying that getting that degree, working to get it, the doing of it under those really terrible conditions changed me into who I, who I am, right? who I became. Education and knowledge and training took me out of that prison cell and gave me a way to think about the world and gave me a way to be in the world. Um, my transformation happened over a long period, but in terms of this, it happened in spite of prison, not because of prison. And that is something that this group can play a role in turning around. And it is, I, it can't, I don't, and there's no way I can say how important it would be to do that. Education is a human right. People in prison are in desperate, and I mean desperate need of alternatives and in need of higher education. When the Pell Grants were eliminated, the message was really clear. You are here to be punished. You are here to be contained. You are not expected to grow. You are not expected to change. And your expectations for your life have no value or meaning to us whatsoever. What a devastating message that is to over 2.3 million people in the United States. What a devastating message. To lessen one's expectations about the quality and content of life is a terrible thing. Living in prison, one, all of us, and I know we'll all speak to it, faces a direct attempt to destroy our human spirit. People in prison are dehumanized and exiled from the free world, and they have little chance of making it back. You see, stating the Pell Grants, valuing the lives of women in prison by supporting higher education can be one step in shifting this punishment paradigm that has completely taken hold of our criminal justice system. Last point, the past month, there was one of the largest national prison strikes in American history. And I don't know if you know that or what you might think about that or what the implications of that might mean, but to go on strike in a prison where you are in a closed institution where you have absolutely no control and no options is really one of the very last resorts. And actually, it takes an enormous amount of courage to be able to take that kind of a stand and a position. Whether you support the strike or not, it's important to recognize what the conditions are that exist that lead people to take that kind of a risk to their own physical being. So they had 10 demands. This was one of the largest strikes. It was really well planned. It was rotating from prison to prison so that it couldn't be shut down instantly. It began on August 7th, which was the day that George Jackson was killed in 1971 in California, in a California prison. And it ended on the day that the Attica uprising took place in September. So it was a long strike. They called for a couple of things. 
They called for, and I just underscore this, the immediate improvement to the conditions of prison and prison policies that recognize the humanity of imprisoned men and women. I want to cry when I hear that, because to demand humanity, that's what we're doing here. That's what I do standing here, and that's what everybody up here is about. Uh, and they called for the reinstatement of Pell Grants. We know that higher education levels equals less recidivism. Let's restore education in prison. It's an expectation and a human right. Let's support and make real rehabilitation. Let's believe in rehabilitation and the pathways that exist for freedom. Thank you so much. to say. I think you got everything but this brilliance up here and I want you all to hear from them. And so I think I'm going to chime in on Susan's last statement. Let's restore higher education to prison as an expectation and a human right. And I think we should think about that as you hear these sisters talking about their experience. What I would like to do though is ask if there's anyone else in, in here who has been impacted by incarceration. If you would raise your hand or stand, that would be great because I would like the people to see and even those who are watching at home. I would acknowledge you. It's incredibly important and brave for people to understand how incarceration impacts all of us. And hopefully, by the end of today, maybe I'll ask that question again and everybody will stand, right? Because incarceration impacts every single one of us sitting here. And I'm grateful that you're here because so that you can listen and see just how that happens. And so I'm going to start with, um, intro well, first, today is October 1st, right? Um, and thank you to Reach Higher for coming today and helping with the FAFSA. Today is the FAFSA launch. And um, after talking to the team at EdTrust, we thought that today would be just very monumental in actually doing this panel on the day of FAFSA because we know that there are barriers, which Michelle will talk about, um, to even people who are, are re-entering, right, from incarceration and the barriers they face even with filling out a FAFSA form. And or Sarita will talk a little bit about also the banning of banning the box on the college applications. And so, thank you retire for um, being here and doing the work that you do and anyone who is here who needs help with that please make sure that you go when we leave here and sign up with them and so to my right I have Sarita side Martin I take my time to read bios because these are accomplishments for women who have been impacted by incarceration so just bear with me please Sarita, Sarita is the founder and executive director of Operation Restoration she has an unrelenting passion to help women successfully re-enter into society after incarceration at the age of 19, she was sentenced to 120 months in federal prison. After serving 110 months, she earned her BS from LSUHSC in New Orleans. In 2016 is when she founded Operation Restoration. And she successfully draft, drafted and passed an Act 276, which became law on August 1st, 2017. And Annie, who's a partner, is also here, um, who helped to do that. And this law prohibits public Post secondary institutions in Louisiana from asking questions relating to criminal history for purposes of admissions. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Serena wants to bring awareness to the fact that Louisiana incarcerates more people per capita than anywhere in the world. She's committed to changing the statistic one woman at a time. Michelle Jones is a first year doctoral, second? second? This is an old bio, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is nearly not all the accomplishments. So she's a second year doctoral student in the American Studies program at New York University and a research fellow at the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History at Harvard University. After being granted a bachelor's degree from Ball State University, Michelle completed a four year seminary ministerial diploma from the University of the South. Her interest in history, women, race, and prisons led her to participate in a scholarly project challenging the narratives 
of the history of women's prisons with a group of incarcerated scholars. Even while incarcerated, Michelle published and presented her research findings to dispel notions of about the, the reach and intellectual capacity of justice-involved women. Michelle's advocacy extends beyond the classroom. While incarcerated, she presented legislative testimony on a reentry alternative she created for long-term incarcerated people that was approved by Indiana State Interim Committee on, criminal, on the Criminal Code. She is currently on the board of Constructing Our Future, a reentry alternative for women created by incarcerated women in Indiana, which provides women leaving prison with access to rehabilitative programming, carpentry job skills, and means to earn their own home and serves as Entrepreneurship Development Director for the Ladies of Hope Ministries, as well as a 2017 Beyond the Bars Fellow. Michelle is currently under contract with the New Press to publish the history of Indiana's carceral institutions for women with fellow incarcerated and formerly incarcerated scholars. As an artist, further, Michelle is interested in finding ways to funnel her research pursuits into theater and dance. Her original play, The Duchess of Stringtown, was produced in December 2017, and people got a, I got a chance to see it in um, New York City. It was also in Indianapolis. So thank you, Michelle, for being here. Woo. And Yorada Guanipa is currently pursuing a PhD of philosophy and business management with a specialization in leadership. She earned a master's degree in human resource manage management and numerous university certificates among a variety of certificates in other educational areas. She's married, she has two sons, and she loves to read and write and listen and, you know, travel and come to D.C. because this is her first time here, so we have to welcome her. <laughs> yes. And she has traveled nationwide and overseas to both England and Ecuador to raise awareness by speaking about what the consequences are of long-term imprisonment have on not only yourself as an incarcerated individual, but also family, including its effects on society. So thank you for being here. And so I'm going to go through and just want everyone, some of us already mentioned a little bit about our time, but how much time you spent while you were incarcerated and what prisons that you were in. And if you took any educational courses, what were they or degrees that you earned? So I'll start myself. I spent three years in federal prison. I did my time in two county jails before going, getting sentenced. I went to Danbury Federal Prison and then Greenville Federal Prison um, in, 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 in oh, Greenville, Illinois. And while I was then, I pursued my certificate in, Chris, in Christian ministry at New York Theological Seminary. Hi, my name is Sarita Stein Martin. I did nine years and two months or 110 months in federal prison. Um, I had a tour, because I used to do a lot. So I used to get shipped all over. So I actually um, started out in New Orleans. I was arrested in New Orleans, and I went to Arlene's Parish Prison. Then I was um, transferred to Texas to Longview, which is Smith County, Longview and Tyler. Then I went to Carswell Federal Prison, and then I was shipped to Danbury in Connecticut, and then I was shipped to Coleman, Florida, and then I was shipped to Tallahassee, Florida. So um, in my nine years and two months, I was at six different institutions. So I took, I'm sorry, <laughs> college classes at the last institution. Tallahassee uh, Community College came in and taught classes, and I did get a business management certification from um, Tallahassee Community College while I was incarcerated. Wow. Okay, I, I have never heard of anybody being shipped. Mm -hmm. um, so my name is Michelle Jones. I was incarcerated 20 years at the Indian Women's Prison. That was the only prison <laughs> I was in. However, the facility packed up and moved from one location to another. So I think I, I was moved, but. Um, so while I was incarcerated, I had already had some courses at IU. IU, Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis, IUPUI, um, but I got my associates and my bachelor's while incarcerated from Ball State University and, and the uh, Theological Seminary as well, and the Teacher's Aid Certification. So. Uh, good afternoon. I was sentenced in 1996 to 15, one five years of incarceration. So while I was in Coleman, I don't know if you know about Coleman, it's a complex. It's the biggest prison complex, I think, in the world. I think, I'm not sure. But while I was there in Coleman camp, 
I feel like I was in a Nazi camp without the gas chambers because it was just, it was nothing to improve. It was no education, it was no programs for improvement. It was just work, work, and work for Unicorn. We used to work sometimes even 18 hours per day because the, 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 um, the, the Unicorn there was new and they need to make furniture for all the office, especially in Washington. So I, yes, so I did a hunger strike. Did you see me fall, but I did. <laughs> I did a hungry cry and I did it by myself because I didn't want it to get another charge. So well, they shipped me to uh, Tallahassee, Florida and put me in a hole. It's an, a, an isolation hole. It's a hole inside the whole unit. It's, it's, it's horrible. It's a unit that it, is horrible. Well, they took me almost dead out of that hole because they didn't even give me water. After 11 days, they rushed me to the hospital in a coma. But I survived. How? I don't know. It, there was always an angel. There was an angel there who said, I'm going to save her, to save me. Well, while I was there, I didn't know that she did. I earned my first college certificate in Tallahassee. It was from Tallahassee Community College in business management. I even have a picture that day. I couldn't believe I myself got a college certificate. If I did this when I was in prison, I can do better. That was in 2001. And then when I was transferred back to Mariana camp, I tried to take a class, but the culture was no for the class. I was the only one taking a class, a long distance class, a math class, and I failed it. And I, I'm not a failed student. I had always been an A plus student, saying, no, this is not for me. So they transferred me back to Coleman. There is no culture for education at Coleman. So I used to touch salsa, uh, business, meditation, whatever, but something to keep your mind going on, you know. I was relieved in 2007, and I wanted to get my associate degree. I already have a certificate. So the college in Miami said, we don't take people with criminal records unless you go to an interview with the dean and the dean accepted. You know how, how nervous I, I was for that interview with the dean? I didn't want it to go. It was like I canceled it three times. You're right up. So, so I, no, <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. I just wanted to, um, to go on that frame of thinking because you, know, you talked about, everyone shared their experiences in education while they were incarcerated the time they had. And you started to talk about the barriers that you faced when you came home and trying to get into for post-secondary um, education, post-incarceration. So I know, Michelle, you talk a lot about you know, the, the, the collateral consequences and things around that. And so I want you to touch a little bit on that piece and then Sarita about what you did around the Band of Box legislation to tie it all into post-incarceration. Um, uh, post-incarceration, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so applying to schools, um, Obviously, you have to apply the semester or the year before you actually go. So a lot of times, people are still incarcerated, right, while they're planning, planning their reentry program. But there are immediate barriers to that because all applications are online. So unless you have someone who's willing to create an account for you and deceive and act as you on a sit on uh, um, act as you and filing um, filing for applications. That's a barrier, an immediate barrier. It's just you can't even get the form. Then other barriers, obviously, um, which we will talk about is ban the box, or uh, not ban the box, but the actual boxes on applications. But it goes even further than that. Say you pass all that, you get the application in, you uh, have a university that doesn't have a box challenge. Um, when you go to put your personal statement in or your career statement and you disclose, there are certain immediate, post box processes that immediately prop up that block and hinder your next step, your next step to even getting admission letters from universities. For example, say the university doesn't have the box. Well, practices that are happening more and more is that people are doing credit checks. And credit checks is a way in which to 
find out if you have any liens against you for criminal justice debt, and it's a way to determine that you have been involved in the criminal justice system. Um, and so those are all collateral consequences to getting access to the public or private liberal university. So the liberal university then acts as a gatekeeper, acts as a tool of, uh, of exclusion um, for people who are trying to advance themselves. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, when we think about that, we think about even probation and parole, you know, and the 4.7 million people who are presently on probation or parole, or some type of pre trial probation or parole, and the fact that a lot of times you're not even encouraged by that office to pursue your high, higher quality education. You're only asked to do what? Hold to a work. job. Hold a job. They'll check and make sure you work in the same place, check and make sure you're at the same address that you were. There's not even that. Press. Actually, I, ex I experience a lot of tension around the fact that I am in school. It's like, well, where's your money coming from? And where's this, 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 this? Oh, you want to go to a conference. Oh, now we need to deal with travel passes. There's a whole other process that starts up because you want to get your education. Actually, you have to get permission to be out after curfew if you have classes that start at 7.30, which I sometimes do. So that's another process. You have to ask permission to move about in the world as a grown-up. So for me, while I was incarcerated, um, it was just natural that I thought that I would be able to continue my education upon release. Education was always a big thing in my family. Um, when I went to prison, my mom was a judge. My dad was a supervisor at an oil refinery, so I didn't come from the normal socioeconomic background that you normally would associate with prison. That wasn't my story. My story is the same as a lot of other women. I was physically abused as a child, so those behaviors manifested, you know, once I became, became a an adult, because I went to prison at 19. Um, so all I knew was I was going to school while I was incarcerated, and I would be able to continue my education upon release. When I was released and I applied to the University of New Orleans, I didn't even, I just, I don't, it wasn't even a thought in my mind that I was not gonna get into school. I had a 3.875 GPA from the classes I took while I was incarcerated. I still had my ACT scores from when I was going to college prior to incarceration, where I was on a full scholarship for physics and engineering. School was never really difficult for me, so I just knew that I would be able to go to school. So I get the letter back because I had checked the box on the application and I was denied entrance into the university. So all I had thought about for the last nine years and two months was going to school upon release and that was no longer an option. So it set me back because I didn't know what to do after. I didn't have a clue. So it took me about two years to decide to muster up the courage and at this time I was married and pregnant. And my husband was like, you know, you always wanted to go back to school, how, you know, you should pursue that. And I'm like, well, how? The box is still there. And I didn't know much about electronics because the internet had happened while I was you know, in prison. So when I got out, um, there it was. And miraculously, my same application was there. And I was fascinated by that whole thing for um, <laughs> another time. And um, I was able to pull up the same application, and all I did was uncheck the box. You know, from have you been convicted to leaving it blank. And I got in. I got scholarship. I mean, they didn't even check to see that it was the same exact application. So that's how I knew that the box is a direct barrier to mm -hmm. admission mm -hmm. into the university. Mm -hmm. Because people who are checking the applications are looking to see if you check yes, and if you are, they're immediately excluding you from being able to attend the university. So for me, my barrier was the box. So I had to lie to go back to school. And I'm not, even though I committed a crime, I'm just not a dishonest person by nature because I admitted to my crime. Because I was guilty, I did it. So it was no need in me trying to get beyond that. So it put me in an uncomfortable position because now I'm in school and I have this thing hanging over my head that I'm formerly incarcerated and I wanna go to med school. I had really high aspirations. And how am I gonna do this? So for me, it was very important. Um, and I saw Dr. Stan and Dracy just walk in the room. We worked really closely with him on the ban of box legislation because Maryland had already started the legislation prior to us trying to implement it in Louisiana. 
and the only reason Louisiana became the first state to uh, pass the law is because their governor vetoed it today. <laughs> <laughs> a little friendly competition, but um, we were able to pull legislation that had been trying to be passed across the United States. We pulled legislation from Illinois, we pulled legislation from Maryland, New York, and California, right? And Annie is also like, she's the brains behind the whole project. You have the brains. <laughs> but um, she actually, we pulled together all of the legislation and we drafted something that was specific to Louisiana. Um, it wasn't everything that we wanted, but we were able to put in the legislation that colleges will not ask the question for purposes of admissions. It doesn't say may, it doesn't say can or should, it says they shall not ask. So that was very important for us, unless it's for supportive reasoning, reasons. So if you want to counsel people about job opportunities, or you need to know specifics because of living arrangements or something of the sort, then it could be asked in that um, capacity. So that was very um, important for us to do. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. And I know last night we talked a little bit about um, conditions of confinement for women. And Susan, I'm gonna bring you in on that um, specifically. How the conditions of confinement for women and how that also hinders um, access to higher education. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I think that there, there really isn't an organized, systematic program of higher education across the board. So, these examples that people are giving of having taken a class here or started something here, there's no, no way to like complete it, you know, and you do need to get out for the most part, certainly in the federal system. I think it is state by state different, differently organized. But, uh, but, I, but the other issue we were talking about this is that, you know, the, the, the question of mental health the question of historical trauma and abuse, the question of who is the population that is in prison, and who are we talking about, and let's give them, you know, the, the, the truth to the lie that they need to be incarcerated at all, okay? So that's another conversation. We're not gonna have that now. I'd be happy to have it anytime. <laughs> um, but, but, uh, so, but I, but I think that part of the, the issue is mental health and people's literal capacity to participate in programming. And how, how do you deal with that? I think the other related thing that really is, we have, we were talking about specifically about Unicor, is that the, the cultural life for women in the federal prison system is defined by work. You have to work. You know, you make 12 cents, 17 cents, 50 cents, maybe a dollar, and you work, in fact, it's factory work. It's all factory work. It may be building furniture, it may be building parachutes, it may be inputting data, but it is, it, the Unicorn Industries is an enormous and very successful financial endeavor of prison labor. Uh, so the, the that they're really a barrier to it is that without a significant cultural, political, social shift about the fact that this is supposed to be rehabilitative and not ret ret retribution for actions, I don't, you know, there's that very fundamental barrier. Mm -hmm. I think mental health is probably one of the most important, yeah. I would say, and the lack of treatment and capacity to deal with what people are experiencing prior to going to prison and while in prison. Right, and um, you're right, I and mean, Serena, I know you wanted to share something, but I know you also talked about that yesterday, the culture, and what that was like, the culture um, while being incarcerated, and how, as Susan said, you just kept focusing on work, 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 right? But what I also want you to share is how, from that culture, when you came, you had your, um, your paralegal license, right, and that you were able to get while you were incarcerated. And when you came home, what happened around that? And this, again, is speaking to the culture of um, post-incarceration and incarceration. Yeah, so uh, the culture doesn't end when you get out of prison. It's still going on while probation. I had five years of probation, 
So when I while, while I was a cancer I earned a paralegal certificate and I have experience I used to be what they call jailhouse lawyers. I used to do motions for myself and for others. So when I get out, I have three job offers from law firms because they read about my, my motions. So I got one of, one of the offers and I went to work as a paralegal. So my PO, PO say, no, you cannot work as a paralegal. I say, why? No, because you know. So if your crime doesn't have to do anything with what are you working, the PO should not stop you to doing that. So I filed a motion by myself before to my judge and he didn't even read the motion and just stopped denying. So I went to the course of appeal, 11 circuit course of appeal, by myself, with all my grammar's errors, and I won. What <laughs> <laughs> is funny, the probation officer told me, I will write a memo to the judge and you will never have access to that memo. I said, I beg you that I will have access to that memo. The course of appeal said that I would sure have access to the memo. And the memory that the reason why I should not work as a paralegal was because it would be very upset for the credit the court to be talking to a former prisoner. Okay. I mean, I was like, all oh, credit the court were nice to me while I was in prison. Why they would be upset when I get out of prison? Well, you guys know, you know, and you tell everybody that it's a, it was a, um, a case in the 11th Secret Court of Appeal. It has been cited a lot because a PO cannot stop you from working in a job, in a decent job, unless, you know, you got in crime with that before, but it's there. Thank you for sharing that. It just shows the resilience of women and how access to higher education while she was incarcerated, she was able to actually use that to try to make a, you know, a, a substantial living for herself, yet again, there are these barriers. So I just wanted to show how that's connected to both inside the prison, how access to higher education can help you know, with having a successful, sustainable, and transformable life, yet, yet and still. And so Sarita, you wanted to add something to what um, Susan was saying? Yeah, just two real quick things. One, mm -hmm. I was um, in segregation you know, for a year straight, from the time I was 21 to 22. Work alone, sell alone, no whatever, outside, nothing. Straight food through the door. Um, so, <laughs> she was holding up, stop. <laughs> so, um, what happened with that was, it put a fear inside of me that when, it, that translated five years down the line when I started school. So my parents paid for me to take college courses while I was incarcerated. That was the only way for me to be able to take the college courses. So being called for an investigation that you had nothing to do with, or and you can't stop it. It's just like outside of prison. It's the same way inside. If someone says you've done something, they're going to put you in the hole, have an investigation. And then it can be at the expense of your education. Because everybody knows that if you're in the college courses while you're incarcerated, you can't go to the special housing unit because they're not going to be responsible to bring your work to you. So if you're in the special housing unit for so long, you just default on that whole semester. And that happened to me while I was in school and I was able to get out within two weeks, but it was because I had people on the outside, other people who are incarcerated, it was like, Sarita had nothing to do with this. She's changed, she has nothing to do with this. She doesn't get into trouble anymore. And I was able to get out within two weeks, but I still was two weeks behind and I was taking three classes at that particular um, moment. And the other thing I wanna say really quick is not only does it need to be a cultural shift inside of how you look at things, but also a lot of these officers aren't allotted the opportunity to further their education. So that creates a culture of them being resentful that you're incarcerated and you can further your education, but as someone who has not committed a crime or been faced with anything, that they don't have the opportunity to also further their education. So it creates this culture of, I'm going to do everything I can to stop you from getting your education. So we have to be responsible citizens as well to make sure that education is also available to everyone who wants to have it. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. And, and just really quick, I know. And, and just really quick, I just would like to add, add to that. So what these ladies are all talking about is how 
stigma is being weaponized against us in our future forays outside of prison. So there is a need for a culture shift inside prisons, but largely these gatekeepers, frontline bureaucrats, street level bureaucrats, whatever term, carceral agents, whatever term you want to use, their mentality and the way that they look at formerly incarcerated people has critically has to shift. I mean, because what is prison for if you believe that prison is supposed to be, the rhetoric that prison is supposed to be real rehabilitative, then why would you continue punishment and a stigma from arrest through incarceration to someone's afterlife of incarceration? What you're doing is you are embedding prejudice into our everyday lives. And we're talking about education, which is something that is supposed to be progressively, class mobility, self financially, socially, economically, mentally uh, progressive so that we can have sustainable lives. Why, what logic are you using that we shouldn't have the ability to progress, to be mobile? Mm -hmm. to, that logic is cancerous and we really need to address that. And, 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 and lastly, I'll say this. In my, when I was incarcerated, higher education, prior to it being snatched away again in 2012, um, was a beautiful experience in what a culture could look like that was more oriented around higher education and community involvement. Mm -hmm. It was the center of the facility that I was in. So our day rooms were different because people were studying. Our rec yards were different because people were having group studies, getting together, working out math, working out um, papers. Um, what we did with our time, we created a culture that was more progressive. And our faculty were more involved in activities that had nothing to do with the education program. They were woven into the fabric of the prison community. And we all benefited, as, as people have talked about, and, and, and particularly Susan, when higher education left our facility, we, we went through a cultural and spiritual break. Suddenly, people who had something to work toward were like, forget it, well, I'll go do this, I'll go do that. It was, it was crushing. 6 a.m., I got a phone call to come to, from the staff waking me up saying education director needs to see you. We go there, they say that they've slid into a previous bill, another bill to get rid of our budget across statewide in the state of Indiana for higher education. They just slipped it at the bottom of another bill. And we woke up one day with no higher education program. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about people who were getting higher education just, just for the actual progress for themselves, but also because they had time cuts. People were planning to go home for Christmas, Thanksgiving, birthdays. People had planned their lives about what this higher education could give them as, in terms of access, and it was pulled. Just, you don't know the devastation of looking at 68 women and you telling them it's over. So I'm saying, think about the quality of the lives of people, that everyday livability that is increased by access to higher education in prison. And then think about how it is a necessary tool to combat weaponized stigma once they get out. And this should be a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. This is something that we should do because it simply makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. about to close out now, I just want to give 30 seconds to each woman to give one recommendation that you think um, could work as far as re-implementing access to higher education within the prisons, whether it be through legislation, the Pell Grant, um, programming, or what can we do? 30 seconds. Susan. I think the first thing is to reinstate them and um, recognize that education, along with other kinds of programming, can begin to shift the entire model that we are witnessing. Thank you. 30 seconds, right? 30 seconds, 30. <laughs> <laughs> I stress 30 for me. But, uh, I, I, she stopped me in one moment that I said that I have to go to, to the dean interview to go back to college. Um, she asked all the questions, what was her crime, blah, 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 and then she said to me, without that disrespecting, why do you want to get a degree if you're not going to get hired by anybody? My answer was, 
Well, I want my degree. It doesn't matter if I don't get a job. I get a title, like a, a professor used to say to us. So I now, in our organization in Miami, I encourage female former incarcerated. I train them to go to the interview with the dean to say that. Well, my recommendation, yes, that's why it should be reinstated for incarcerated and former incarcerated. Help our community, each other one at a time, and empower females, uh, uh, to, females because we are the, the, the basis of the society, to go back to the prison. 30 minutes. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna try 30 seconds. Um, so I would like for everyone to think about advocating for more transparency. Mm. More transparency in public universe, public and private universities that get tax dollars on your admissions policies. They shouldn't be able to extract funds in the name of the state, of, of all of us, and then practice ex cosmic exclusionary practices without oversight. There needs to be eyes on this. Thank you. <laughs> so my recommendation, of course, is to um, institute the Pell Grant, but the other big thing for me would be there needs to be a consistent um, brand of education that is offered to people while they're incarcerated, and formerly incarcerated individuals need to participate and what that should look like and what is realistically possible and allow us to go in. Annie and myself, we teach in, we have a college of prison program through my organization in um, Louisiana with Tulane, we're partnered with Tulane University. And the most uh, important thing is having formerly incarcerated people come back in to teach those classes. Because the one thing you never hear when you're incarcerated are the good stories. You only hear the bad stories and the recidivism and the things that are going on. But it gives people the fortitude and the strength to know that when we are allowed to go back in and assist and help in the educational process, they want it just as much as we do. And I have to tell Annie all of the time, I'm like, the students that are in prison are not like your students at Tulane. We're going to study with a magnifying glass if we have to. It doesn't matter if the print is incorrect. So making sure that we have a consistent level of education, we're helping to design that education that are formerly incarcerated people, and treating them as students as you would on a regular university because they're capable. We don't need any special favors. We just need the opportunity and the access, and it makes the world for all of us a better place. Yeah. And I'll follow up by just saying that you know, there's, there's legislation out there right now, like the First Step Act, that actually speaks to changing the conditions of confinement for women, um, giving good time credit that would also actually, if you're doing programming, at higher education falls right into that, and amongst other things. So there's legislation that's already out there that would actually, you know, help benefit incarcerated people. Um, and to sum it all up, you know, here you see a group of brilliance, right? And every woman has been touched by access to high, higher education. And so what I would also encourage you is when you are doing work around criminal justice reform or actually needing people to have that voice, pay us. We're consultants, right? We're contractors. All you have to do is, is, is pay us to do the work because we work, we do great work, and I think this was demonstrated here today. So thank you so much. Education Trust. I want to first thank again this amazing, courageous, impressive panel of women. Can we give them another round of applause? I want to thank Topeka Sam and the Ladies of Hope Ministries for co hosting this event and for all the work that they do on behalf not only of the women who they serve, but on behalf of all of us to strengthen all of our communities. 
I want to thank the Lumina Foundation and all of the advocates and partners who are here in this room and who are part of this effort to restore access to Pell Grants for folks who are incarcerated. I want to thank the Reach Higher team for being here and for signaling along with us that on this day that the FAFSA opens, that people begin to have access to Pell Grants, and we need to make sure that folks who are incarcerated have access to those opportunities. I want to thank Senator Schatz and Congressman Davis. They can't be here, but they are both congressional champions of this work, committed to restoring Pell access, and we want to continue to partner with them in this effort. And finally, I want to thank Allison uh, for interrupting her busy schedule of uh, movies that we're all going to be excited to see. Um, and I want to thank her for lending her voice uh, to not only this issue today, but to issues of social justice and criminal <coughs> justice reform. I admit I'm a little starstruck. Get Out is one of my favorite movies. Um, but, but, it, but it's an important signal that, that she's here about the, the importance of these issues. But before I turn it over to her, I just want to say a few words of reflection on this conversation. I want to remind us of the urgency of this work. The fact that there is someone today, right now, incarcerated within miles of us where we sit, who wishes she could have access to education, but doesn't because of this law that we have put in place as a country. Right? I want to remind us that there's someone who's returned from prison and wants to support their family and contribute to the community, but can't because of the collateral consequences that you heard about on this panel. I want to remind us that there's a young person who was suspended from school today who is now being fed into a school to prison pipeline and won't have access to the opportunities that all of us in this room have had. I want to remind us that this isn't a problem from yesterday. This is a problem today. It is affecting people's lives. And the question for all of us is what are we going to do about it? And part of the reason I care about this so deeply is that I am a beneficiary of second chances. And those of you who know me know, know that part of my life's journey was that I lost both my parents when I was a kid. Uh, my mom when I was eight, my dad when I was 12. And it was New York City public school teachers who made school a safe and nurturing place that saved my life. My father was very sick with undiagnosed alcohol. Alzheimer's home was this place that was scary and unpredictable, but it was teachers who gave me a sense of hope and possibilities. Education that gave me a reason to continue living. Yeah. Right? But then, like many young people who've experienced trauma, I got in a lot of trouble. I got kicked out of high school. I always say to folks, I'm the first secretary of education to have ever been kicked out of high school. <laughs> um, but then people still decided to give me a second chance. They decided to invest in me. They could have said, here's an African-American, Latino male, doesn't have respect for authority, in trouble all the time. They could have given up on me. They could have walked away from me. And if they had, I'd easily be dead today. But they didn't. Right? A series of teachers in New York City public schools gave me a chance. A series of teachers in New Jersey public schools gave me a chance, gave me a second chance, gave me, let's be honest, a third chance and a fourth chance because they saw more hope and more possibility in me than I could see in myself. And so to me, this work is deeply personal. We have a shared obligation to make educational opportunity available for anyone who wants to take advantage of it. And we know that education can transform lives. That's why during the Obama administration, we launched the Second Chance Pell Program, because we know it was a mistake in the 90s when Pell Grants were banned. We knew we, we couldn't yet persuade Congress to change the law, but we were able, through the Experimental Authority under the Higher Education Act, to launch a pilot project. There are 69 colleges and universities around the country that are using Pell Grants to give folks who are incarcerated an opportunity to get higher education today. And it's not enough. Right, we need to do much more. We need to restore Pell access for folks who are incarcerated. We need to tackle the problems around uh, the use of the box. We need to tackle collateral consequences. But we can start with restoration of Pell access. And as we do that, we have to remember that this isn't just about educational opportunity. This is about justice. What kind of society do we want to be? Do we want to be a just society? 
Do we want to say to people, yes, you've made a mistake, and that's why you're incarcerated, but the goal here isn't, as we heard about in the panel, isn't about retribution. The goal is about the opportunity to restore a path to opportunity. We want folks to be able to have that access. We know that folks who receive any kind of educational program while incarcerated are 43% less likely to return to prison. When you visit these programs, just as you heard from the women on the panel today, you hear the transformational, trans transformational impact of education, not only on folks' opportunities to work, but on their opportunities to contribute to their family and their community. That's what's possible here. A restoration of our collective commitment to justice. So let me close with this. George Washington Carver once said, when reflecting on all of the challenges faced in our society and inequities in our society, said, simply start where you are with what you have Make something of it and never be satisfied. There are lots of challenges in our society, lots of obstacles to opportunity. There are lots of places where we need to do better, whether it's on issues of access to education or criminal justice reform. But this is a place where we can start. We can start with restoration of Pell access for folks who are incarcerated. That is something we can and should do together. So thank again, please, this amazing panel. Thank you all for being here. Now let me introduce Allison, who is, as you all know, an acclaimed actress and star from the movie Get Out and the HBO series Girls. Allison is um, very involved in the Transformation Prison Project. She's an ambassador for RED, which is an organization that's doing critical work in the fight against AIDS. She is deeply involved in Horizons National, which helps provide opportunities for summer enrichment for students from low-income families. Uh, she is not only an incredibly talented actress, but a person who is deeply committed to social justice and an activist. And we're just thrilled to have her here. Allison. Thank you so much, Secretary King. This is awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I feel really lucky. and. I almost scrapped all of my remarks because I feel like Kanye covered most of it on Saturday night. But um, just a few things um, I wanted to say. I'm sure you feel weird that the white supremacist lady from Get Out is talking to you. <laughs> I totally get it. The name of like word association with second chance Pell Grants, my name not coming up, and I know. But um, as Secretary King pointed out, these are this is kind of the merger of two areas that are deeply, deeply meaningful to me. The um, improved access to education for everybody and criminal justice reform. Um, and I've spent the past few years diving into this area as much as possible, trying to educate myself about this work after a lifetime of observing it from afar. So I just, I feel really, really lucky to be able to talk to you about why these grants are a moral imperative. But on the topic of second chances, which I believe what is what these grants are really about, I feel like I have to admit that my life has been the kind of life where I kind of had permanent second chances. Um, obviously, there was nothing about my mind intrinsically that made me extraordinarily deserving of grace or anything that made my staying in school and eventually graduating from college something that everyone, including myself, just kind of assumed would happen. The consequences for my mistakes were determined carefully by the adults around me so as not to disrupt the path I was on, the path that was there for me from the moment I was born. All I had to do was walk a straight line. And sometimes when I swerved, the adults around me and forces would create little bumpers like a bowling alley. And I'm guessing there are others like me in this room. We are the people who just get second chances. And for the most part, the people in charge of this country are also the people who automatically got and still get second chances. And I always figured that if those in power could understand that they've always had those bumper lanes, they could appreciate that it's our responsibility to extend that opportunity to everyone. I was lucky enough to be raised by two parents who were borderline obsessed with pointing out to me from like three years old that I had earned nothing that I had. It's kind of a heavy concept when it's a Barbie that they're talking about, but it sinks in. And I've spent, in contrast to that, almost my entire life around the kind of person who has never thought about their second chances. Or worse, he's never thought about the fact that everyone doesn't get them. Or worse still, he's thought about it and he doesn't think everyone deserves them. 
spend a lot of time around this, let's, let's say it's a man, you know, <laughs> it's an archetype, I'm from Connecticut, you're all picturing the right thing, just trust your <laughs> And when I'm talking to one such person about these issues, I find myself saying, well, what if it were you? You know that thing we all do. What if it was you? What if it was your child or your spouse or anyone you know? You would expect a second chance. And those incarcerated all over our country are someone's to someone, too. And they are hoping for a second chance that they doubt will ever come. And even more agonizing, sometimes when that chance comes along, they can't afford it. But we can change that with these grants. Now, sometimes that works, and then sometimes this person just looks at me like he wishes I was talking to him about something simpler, like puppies, or whether or not I think Elon Musk is doing okay. But then, I try presenting this hypothetical to him. If you were an anthropologist alien, stay with me, arriving on Earth to study the United States, you would observe that we are obsessed with punishing each other. And worse, deep down, we seem to know better, because to cope with the guilt, but by pretending it's for our own safety, we move people out of our line of sight so we can't be reminded of their humanity. And just as this man, this hypothetical man, is about to say, well, some people do really bad things, I acknowledge that it's true, that there is a small number of people who shouldn't walk among us. But I tell him that when it comes to everyone else, millions of people, we are hypocrites, because when it comes to the other, we're merciless, while wholeheartedly believing in redemption, when it's personal. When it's your kid, they are capable of redeeming themselves, rehabilitation. When it's someone else, they should be locked away forever. This is an undoubtedly ugly part of who we are and who we have always been as a nation. We didn't trip and fall and accidentally incarcerate so many of our fellow citizens. We did it deliberately. And every day we spend not fixing it is a day that we decide we're okay with it. I remind him that it's much easier to live with this hypocrisy when your life hasn't been touched by the system. And if you can't see the people who are incarcerated, it's easier not to think about them. And here's where I'm wishing this hypothetical Connecticut elite man were here today, because then I could say, well, here they are. There they are. Tell me you weren't blown away by what you just heard and saw. These women are special because they came through this horrible system, and they succeeded despite it, thanks to their access to Pell Grants. Imagine then if all formerly incarcerated students came back to us ready to find a job, degree, or degrees in hand, and with a specific plan as to how they're gonna conquer this unimaginably difficult transition. So, in the absence of that aforementioned conversation partner, I'd like to address the aides and staffers in the room who are undoubtedly far more compassionate and are here because you're curious about the issue. You are the people in the rooms where it happens, and I need you to walk out of here convinced to do the right thing. Hindsight isn't kind to our politicians, is it? Over the course of my life, I've had to add a mental asterisk to the name of all of our greatest leaders after considering their effects on poverty, crime, incarceration, education, and so many other issues I care about. Almost every single one of our politicians who did some great things also helped put this evil system into place, or kept it in place by doing nothing to fix it. But here's the good news. You're still here. The people you work with are still in power, which means you still have the opportunity to make it, to make it so that with the 2020 vision of hindsight, there won't be an asterisk after their name. They can do the right thing here, knowing that history and people in the future will see them as having been part of the solution rather than part of the problem. I know that might seem grandiose, but I am certain that supporting this initiative will look good in the rearview mirror. Now let's say you happen to work with someone who's more cowardly lying than Dorothy, totally fine. Allow me to help you by outlining the argument in like a totally sort of pragmatic way, and I'm gonna use um, the transitive property, so I hope you have like wor a working memory of algebra. <laughs> People should have access to a good, non-cost prohibitive education. Those who err, even with dire consequences, are people. Ergo, people who make mistakes should have access to good, non-cost prohibitive education. And if that doesn't work, for good measure, you can throw this in. Do they want our economy to be strong for people in all income brackets? Do they want the crime rate to continue dropping? Do they want low recidivism rates? With Pell for incarcerated students, we can drastically improve the operational success of the entire system. And if that doesn't work, Finish your argument by painting a picture of what you've seen here today. The women you heard from are extraordinary, and they are many. 
Give those in prison access to these grants and they will seek education with the ferocity and tenacity that you've just seen displayed before you today. And when those students come back to us, they will join the workforce with wisdom, compassion, and experience that the rest of us can truly only imagine. They will be woven back into the fabric of their families and will have an increased ability to bring in an income. They will represent the incredible lemonade that can be made out of the lemons of our criminal justice system. Let's live in a country where everyone gets a second chance. The ban on Pell Grants for Justice impacted individuals must be lifted, so let's make it happen. You're in charge, we're counting on you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you all for coming today, and we look forward to partnering with many in this room to get this done. Thank you. Thank you.